Hello and welcome to Ace the English Hub. We are discussing another essay for easy analysis today. Do subscribe to receive notifications about our new videos. Our essay for today is Samuel Johnson's Preface to Shakespeare. Samuel Johnson was born at Staffordshire on September 18, 1709. His father was a provincial bookseller. Johnson as a boy acquired much of his knowledge from reading the books in his father's shop. Johnson had many physical infirmities including bad eyesight and facial disfigurements. He studied in the grammar schools and later at Oxford, but he had to leave the university without a degree in 1729 because of financial difficulties. In 1735 he married a widow who was 20 years his senior with whom he set up his own school. When the venture became unsuccessful they moved to London in 1737. Johnson lived in poverty working as a translator and hack writer. He edited the Gentleman's Magazine providing fictionalized accounts of the proceedings of parliament and short biographies, essays and poems. The Life of Richard Savage is his biographical work written about his friend. It is now recognized as an important milestone in the development of the art of biography. In 1746 he began his works to produce a dictionary of the English language. In 1755 he produced two large folio volumes. Meanwhile he had written two imitations of Juvenal in sonorous couplets, London in 1738 and The Vanity of Human Wishes in 1749. His blank verse tragedy Irene was produced at Drury Lane in February 1749 with meager success. Early in the 1750s he wrote some 200 periodical essays in his periodical The Rambler. In June 1756 he issued proposals for a new edition of Shakespeare and also started a new periodical The Literary Magazine or Universal Review. For 2 years he contributed a weekly essay under the title of The Idler to a weekly The Universal Chronicle. His philosophical tale Rasselas was written when he was in dire need of money to meet the expenses of his mother's funeral. From 1762 he started receiving a royal pension of 300 pounds a year and for the rest of his life he wrote only what he wished. Of his late published works the most notable were a series of political pamphlets written in the early 1770s an account of his journey with Boswell to the western islands of Scotland and a series of biographical and critical prefaces to an edition of the English Poets of the 17th and early 18th centuries He died on December 13 1784 in London being prey to asthma and other ailments Johnson's preface to Shakespeare is considered a classic document of English literary criticism. Johnson provides an appreciative analysis of both the merits and demerits of Shakespeare like a true critic. This preface was written after Johnson had spent 9 years in producing an edition of Shakespeare's plays. Three basic concerns are discussed in this preface. How a poet's reputation is established the poet's relation to nature and the relative virtues of nature and experience of life as against reliance on principles established by criticism and convention johnson begins his preface by stating that the excellence of a work is determined by the period of time it remains relevant and is held in esteem and that no work can be deemed worthy unless it is compared with other works of the same kind if we judge shakespeare by these criteria we can say that he has assumed the importance of the ancients since his reputation has survived the customs opinions and circumstances of his time and is still read and appreciated after centuries Johnson states that the reason behind Shakespeare's success is that he dealt with human truths that are permanent and universal and hence they stand the test of time. Let's look at the important aspects dealt with in Johnson's preface. First is Shakespeare's characters. Johnson points out that Shakespeare's characters are not molded by the accidents of time, place and local custom. Rather, they reflect human nature. 
His characters are guided by the same principles by which all human minds are guided. His characters are true to the age, sex and profession to which they belong. Hence, one character's speech cannot be put in the mouth of another. They are inherently different. His characters are not exaggerated. Even with supernatural agencies, the dialogues are closely related to life. Other poets present a character as an individual, but in Shakespeare, a character is a species. It is because of these reasons that Shakespeare's plays are filled with practical axioms and domestic wisdom. Shakespeare's characters are not heroes but men. He expresses human sentiments in human language. His speech is derived from the common intercourse of life. Johnson defends Shakespeare against charges brought by critics and writers such as John Dennis, Thomas Rymer and Walter that Shakespeare's characters insufficiently reflect their time period and status, that his Romans are not sufficiently Roman and his kings not sufficiently royal. Johnson retorts that Shakespeare always makes nature predominate over accident and he preserves the essential character. Next, let's see Johnson's views about Shakespeare's plays. Shakespeare's plays are a storehouse of practical wisdom. We can formulate a philosophy of life from his plays. His plays represent not just love, but a variety of human passions. Shakespeare approximates the remote and familiarizes the wonderful. Johnson calls Shakespeare the poet of nature, the poet who holds up a mirror of manners and life to his readers. Next is Shakespeare's use of tragic comedy. Shakespeare has been criticized by many for mixing tragedy and comedy. Johnson supports Shakespeare by acknowledging that Shakespeare's plays are not tragedy or comedy in its strict sense, but they exhibit real human nature where life is a mix of good and evil, joy and sorrow, tears and smiles. He points out that Shakespeare's practice is contrary to the rules of criticism, but Johnson believes that nature is a higher authority than rules or tradition. He views that the tragic comedy is nearer to life than tragedy or comedy as it combines within itself the pleasure and instruction of both tragedy and comedy. Moreover, Johnson says that the mixed genre makes for greater variety and we always find pleasure in variety. Johnson also points out that when Shakespeare's plays were first edited by members of his acting company, they did not distinguish clearly between the three classifications of tragedies, comedies and histories. The common aspects in all these three forms were that Shakespeare's mode of composition is the same. It's a mix of seriousness and merriment and he never fails to attain his purpose. Next is Faults of Shakespeare. Johnson agrees that Shakespeare had many faults. He notes that Shakespeare writes without moral purpose and is more careful to please than to instruct. There is an absence of a system of social duty in Shakespeare's plays. There is no poetic justice in his plays. His good and bad actions are operated by chance. Johnson insists that a writer's duty is to make the world better. Shakespeare's absence of poetic justice does not follow the writer's duty. Other faults of Shakespeare cited by Johnson are the looseness of his plots. Johnson notes that a little attention would have improved them. Shakespeare's plays have a lack of regard for the distinction of time or place. Persons from one age or place are indiscriminately given attributes pertaining to other eras and locations. He neglects opportunities of instruction that his plots offer, often neglects the later parts of his plays and so his catastrophes often seem forced and improbable. Johnson views that Shakespeare's jokes are often gross and licentious. He marks that there is a pomp of diction in his narrations. His set speeches are cold and weak. They are often verbose and too large for thought. Trivial ideas are represented in rich epithets. Shakespeare fails to follow through with scenes that evoke terror and pity. He often fails at moments of great excellence. 
He has a terrible love for quibbles and wordplay. He will sacrifice reason, propriety and truth for the use of a pun. There are also many faults of chronology and anachronisms in his play. The next major aspect of the essay is Johnson's defense of Shakespeare's use of unities. Johnson supports Shakespeare on his neglect of the classical unities of drama. He questions the ancients' rule of unities of time, place and action. He exempts Shakespeare's histories from any requirement of unity since these are neither tragedies nor comedies. Hence, he is not required to follow classical rules of unities. According to Johnson, the only unity histories need is the consistency and naturalness in his characters. The change of actions should be understood and the incidents should be various and affecting. Shakespeare does this faithfully. No other unity is needed in writing histories. Johnson argues that Shakespeare has maintained the unity of action in his place. His plots are not structured by complication and denouement because in the real world too there is no particular order of events. Shakespeare being a poet of nature was only true to the way things are. Johnson also points out that Shakespeare does observe Aristotle's requirement that a plot must have a beginning, middle and end. Johnson agrees that Shakespeare showed no regard for the unities of time and place. Johnson goes on to question these unities himself. He views that these unities have only provided trouble to the poet and no particular pleasure to the audience. Johnson considers that these unities arise from the need of providing credibility to drama. These unities were considered important on the belief that the mind of the spectator or the reader is unable to connect with the play depicting falsehood or departing from reality. In Johnson's eyes, the audience never mistakes a play for reality. He views that fiction can never be real and the audience knows this. If a spectator can imagine the stage to be Alexandria and the actors to be Antony and Cleopatra, he can surely imagine much more. Spectators are always aware that they are subjecting themselves to a form of temporary self-delusion. Therefore, there is no absurdity in showing different actions in different places. Johnson goes on to say that imitations produce pleasure or fear because they remind us of realities and not because we mistake them for realities. Therefore, a story needs only unity of action. The unities of time and place both arise from false assumptions and diminish the variety of drama. Hence, these unities need not be followed so that we could attain nobler beauties like variety and instruction. Johnson says that the greatest virtues of a play are to copy nature and instruct life. Johnson at this point is in fact setting principles of drama. Hence, he is arguing logically against the use of unities of time and place. He is ready to set Shakespeare as an alternative source of authority against the classical tradition. Next, we discuss Shakespeare's comic genius. Johnson says that comedy came naturally to Shakespeare. He seems to produce comic scenes without much labor. These scenes are durable and hence they have stood the test of time. The language of his comic scenes is the language of real life which is neither gross nor over-refined and hence it is still relevant. Shakespeare writes tragedies with great appearance of toil and study but there is always something wanting in his tragic scenes. His tragedy seems to be skill, his comedy instinct. Johnson discusses a number of merits of Shakespeare. Shakespeare perfected the blank verse, imparted to it diversity and flexibility, and brought it nearer to the language of prose. Johnson views Shakespeare as one of the original masters of our language. He agrees that Shakespeare lacked formal learning and that the greater part of his excellence was the product of his own genius. Instead of imitating his predecessors, Shakespeare directly obtained knowledge of everything around him by contemplation. Johnson remarks that the form, the characters, the language and the shows of the English drama are his. He also points out that Shakespeare's reputation stands mainly because of his audience. They were ready to praise his grace and overlook the problems in his place. The value of Johnson's work is in the immense learning behind his judgments. He consistently displays his familiarity with the text 
and his generalizations are rooted in specific passages from the dramas. Further, Johnson is the first among the great Shakespeare critics to stress the playwright's sound understanding of human nature. Johnson's focus on character analysis initiated a critical trend that would be dominant in Shakespeare criticism for more than a century, influencing the great work of critics such as Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Charles Lamb and A.C. Bradley. His systematic attempt to measure Shakespeare against others, both classical and contemporary, became the model. Second, the preface to Shakespeare exemplifies Johnson's belief that good criticism can be produced only after good scholarship has been practiced. The critic who wishes to judge an author's originality or an author's contributions to the tradition must first practice sound literary reading and research in order to understand what has been borrowed and what has been invented. That's all for today. We'll see you again next week with another video. Do subscribe to our channel if you like our content. Thank you.